Welcome to the preaching ministry of First Cumberland Presbyterian Church of Chattanooga. This recording is simply the sermon portion of our worship service. To experience our full worship service, we encourage you and invite you to join us Sunday morning at 11 in our beautiful sanctuary located at 1505 North Moore Road. This is Trinity Sunday, the Sunday that we celebrate and, and are in awe of the mystery of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one. Our scripture passage today is John 16, 12 through 21, and you will hear in the passage references to the Spirit and the Father, and it is Jesus the Son who speaks these words at the Last Supper, John the 16th chapter. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own, but will speak whatever He hears, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify Me, because He will take what is Mine and declare it to you. All the Father has is Mine. For this reason I said that He will take what is Mine and declare it. To you. A little while and you will no longer see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. Then some of his disciples said to one another, What does he mean by saying to us, A little while and you will no longer see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. They said, What does he mean by this, a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew what they wanted to ask him. And so he said to them, Are you discussing among yourselves what I meant when I said, A little while and you will no longer see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice. You will have pain, but your pain will turn into joy. When a woman is in labor, she has pain. Because her hour has come, but when her child is born, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy of having brought a human being into the world. So, you have pain now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take that joy from you. My brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In one of the most iconic lines in Hollywood history, Jack Nicholson in a marine dress uniform in a courtroom yells at a young Tom Cruise who is a young JAG lawyer and he says to him, you can't handle the truth. He is trying to belittle Tom Cruise, trying to make him uh, seem weak or naive or soft. In this morning's scripture lesson, Jesus, dressed in a robe, still damp from washing his disciples' feet in an upper room at a Passover celebration, tells his disciples that they can't handle any more truth for that evening. He says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But he doesn't say this because he wants to shame them. No, he says it because he knows that they are unable to wrap their minds and their hearts around the truth that he is going to die and then he is going to be raised up. He knows that they can't imagine the horror that they are about to experience and neither can they imagine the joy that will come after that. And so he makes them a promise. The Holy Spirit will come to them and will guide them into the truth, the truth they can't handle at the moment but a truth they will later be able to handle because of the Holy Spirit. To try to prepare them, however, Jesus does tell them, very truly I tell you, that you will weep and mourn even while the world rejoices, and you will have pain, but your pain will turn to joy. It's like when a woman is in labor and she has pain because her hour has come, but when her child is born, she no longer remembers that anguish because of the joy of having brought a human being into the world. And so he tells them, you have pain now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice. And so beautifully he says, and no one will take your joy from you. 
Jesus is trying to get them to see, if only faintly, that through his suffering and through the suffering that they will have because of his suffering, God is going to bring something brand new into the world. Resurrected life. But this is a tough truth for us to understand as well. Liz Titchener is a priest in the Episcopal Church. In 2014, when she was still in her 20s, her mother, who had battled alcoholism and some other mental diseases for much of her life, chose to end her life by jumping off of a building. Still reeling with grief, both from her mother's death and the manner of her death, Eliz discovered that she and her husband were pregnant with their third child. And so uh, she went through the pregnancy and less than a year after her mother died, little Fritz was born. Now Fritz, of course, was not a replacement for her mother, but he did bring much joy after all of the pain of the preceding months. However, when Fritz was five weeks old, he got sick. Liz and her husband late one night took him to an urgent care uh, center. Uh, they took a look at him, examined him, and the doctor said they thought that he would be fine and they should just take him back home. And so they took him back home, wanting to keep a little closer eye and ear on him. They put him in bed with them and went to sleep. But some hours later, they woke up and realized that Fritz had died. It's impossible for me to imagine uh, grief like that. I have been with families who have lost children, but that isn't part of my experience, and I wouldn't begin to say that I understand that kind of grief. I understand that Liz was in such tremendous pain now in less than a year, having lost her mother and her child. And she says that as she worried and, wor and wondered and grieved over the weeks and months that followed, she began to think of Mary, the mother of Jesus. She began to think about the fact that her own mother had held her as a baby and what that must have been like for her mother. She remembered holding Fritz and her other children as they were babies and how much joy they brought. And then she was forced to remember holding Fritz's little lifeless body and she knew that Mary had done the same and she wondered what it was like for Mary how can this be why must this be And 
Susanna McCurdy and Danny Williams, thank you. Liz wallowed in grief for a while, as anyone would. Like the disciples in that upper room, she says that she first tried to make sense of it all. Uh, we see the disciples in this morning scripture lesson asking each other questions, trying to wrap their minds around what Jesus is telling them and being unable to. And Liz also eventually realized that there was no logic in her loss. She says, you can't patch up a hole blasted in your life with platitudes such as God doesn't make mistakes or God needed another little angel in heaven or it was just his time. And she began to realize that those are actually ways of, of our ways of not handling the truth, not accepting the truth, that there are no simple answers. The truth is that death and evil still have power in our world. By their very definition, they are part of the chaos that we see God bringing order and beauty and life out of at the beginning of creation. And yet the chaos that returns in the Garden of Eden because of human sin. And so Jesus tells his disciples that his death is going to be like the pain experienced by the woman, by a woman who is giving birth. Pain that, as I have been told, is worse and more intense than any other pain. Again, something I can only imagine but really cannot fathom. But it is a pain that brings forth something brand new. And that something is resurrection. Perhaps Simone Weil said it best when she said, The extreme greatness of Christianity lies in the fact that it does not seek a supernatural remedy for suffering, but a supernatural use of for it and in a mystery that logic can never unlock the death of Jesus inaugurates something brand new into the world order and beauty are being restored to the world even while chaos and death and evil still have some sway yet the resurrection is dawning on those bringing them to an end and bringing order and beauty and life to the world now that does not mean at all that the tragic deaths of parents or children are merely birth pangs to something better. That they ever will say how joyful they are because of that. No, the death of Jesus is something entirely unique in all of human history. Jesus alone of everyone who has ever lived actually literally chose to die in a way that none of us can. Just a few weeks ago, we celebrated Memorial Day and we celebrated those brave men and women who did put their lives on the line for us and gave their lives for our freedom. And yet what they did was not to, to give their life in a way that if, if they had not, they would have continued to live forever and ever. They, they merely shortened their lives, if you will. Likewise, there are things that we can do to try to prolong our lives, to exercise, to, to eat right, to follow our doctor's advice, all of those kind of things. And they may prolong our lives, but we don't get to choose to die. We will die. But Jesus, part of the Trinity, part of the three in one was immortal. And he chose to take on flesh. To take on mortality. He chose to die for us. And again, logic cannot fully uncover why this is the case. But because Jesus chose to die for us in that way, God was able to use that death to unfang death, to unhinge death, and to make death not the threat that it was before. And yet we still have death in our world. What do we do about that? Liz says that part of what helped her find her way during that terrible time was the way that her community, her family of faith, cared for her and supported her. When they went to the funeral home and the funeral director was explaining to them the way that the service would happen, he said, when we get to the graveside service, you can go through the service and then you can leave and we have people at the cemetery who will take care of burying uh, the urn that has Fritz's ashes in it. And Liz realized that just wouldn't be right, not for her. And she said, no. He's my son. I can't have a stranger bury him. I need to bury him. I need my friends to help me. And she let it be known that she needed help with that. And the church responded. And so at the graveside service, there were people there with shovels. And when the service ended together, they buried the urn with those precious, precious ashes in it. 
later when their family was planning a trip to get away and try to recover a bit, a friend came by bringing wrapped presents for, for the two children. And, and, and the children unwrapped their presents and inside were little stuffed sloth animals, little, little stuffed animals that were sloths. And they were designed to be able to put in the microwave and be heated up and then they could be put in the bed for the children. And they had this wonderful warm presence with them in the bed. And after the kids had opened up their presents and saw their stuffed animals, then the friend brought out a third present. And it was another stuffed sloth. And the friend said, this one is Fritz's. And even though Fritz isn't with you anymore, he will always be part of your life. And this is one of the ways that Fritz can go with you on this trip. Liz said that was so comforting to her because her friend was acknowledging that you don't just get over a loss and move forward. But that Fritz would always be part of their life. Liz says the most powerful thing she discovered was the power of compassion, particularly when she realized what that word really means. It's a, it's a compound word. Calm is the beginning of that, and it's where we get our word community. It is where people are with us together, and then passion. Passion, not like the passion we have for our favorite hobby or a sports team, but like the passion of the Christ, suffering. Calm passion is when people come and they suffer with us. Liz writes, the roots of the word compassion reveal an important truth. To live in connection with others in an imperfect world, we must suffer with them. Liz says that perhaps oddly she looked forward to Ash Wednesday on that year after her mother and Fritz died. For the whole church to gather together and tell the truth to one another. You are dust. And to dust you shall return as the sign of the cross was being made on their forehead. She needed to hear that truth. She needed the whole church to together proclaim that truth. And because of the cross, to know that that isn't the only truth we have to stand by. She said, I think very powerfully, reminding people that they are going to die is actually an odd way of telling them that you love them. Friends, I love you. So let me tell you the truth. You are going to die. And before that time, you may face all kinds of chaos and tragedy and other loss. And yet, this is a truth that you can handle. You can handle that truth because of what Jesus did for us compassion. Not merely suffering with us, but suffering for us. And his suffering birth something brand new in the world. This doesn't exempt us from death and chaos and suffering, but it does give us direction. We are to have compassion for others and to allow others to have compassion for us. And at the end of that long road, Jesus promised to us is one that will be found to be the truth. We will know the truth and it will bring us a joy that no one can take from us. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this message from the preaching ministry of First Cumberland Presbyterian Church. Once more, we hope you'll join us in person Sunday at 11 a.m. for worship.